initiative and you talk to people about where your strengths and interests are, a lot of times they'll work with you to get you there. And so don't leave it up to someone else, you know, to shape your career. Make sure that you're observant and you're experiencing different things. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Life in Accounting. We are a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for this podcast. Well, we have another interesting guest for you this week. Delene Taylor with an accounting firm in Kentucky joined us for this podcast. And what's a little unique about Delene is that although she is a certified public accountant, she's been out of the traditional accounting roles for quite some time now. Early in her career, she had the opportunity to get into the people side of the business, HR and and firm administration, and then into the marketing side, which is what she's been doing now for several years. And I guess I really enjoyed this interview for a few reasons. I personally find marketing interesting and, and enjoy working some in that space. But then also, I really like to highlight how starting in accounting truly can set you up for practically any career field. And I think Delene's career is a great example of that. Plus, as you'll hear in the interview itself, Delene is just a happy person, and it's always great to interview happy people. If you do enjoy this podcast yourself, please check us out online. We have all kinds of other materials for you at www.whereaccountantsgo.com. We have audio content, we have written content, of course, all our podcasts, we have some blogs, we have books, and even a few tools for employers as well. And if you haven't noticed yet, we just launched a job board about a month ago. You can find all that at www.whereaccountantsgo.com. Well, with that, let's go ahead and get started with this interview. Here's Delene Taylor. Well, hello, Delene. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Well, for our audience, we have Delene Taylor on the line with us today, and this is actually going to be a double first for us. Delene is the first person in Kentucky that we've had on the show, and she's also the first person, I believe, that we've had on the show that's taken their career really more in the direction of marketing. For accounting firms, although yes, you know she is a CPA and, and she started her career in more of a typical accounting role, you know something we would all recognize. Delene, I, I'm really excited about this interview because I like to highlight how our backgrounds in accounting can can really serve us in many ways. But before we you know get into your transitions and, and your current position, let's cover their early days so the audience you know gets a picture of how you got to where you are today and what that progression was like. How did you sure. initially decide to, you know, consider accounting as a possible career in the first place? Well, my mother was a bookkeeper and my dad worked for IBM and he worked on some of the big systems and hospitals that would fill an entire room. Then he transitioned to the first personal computers when they came on the market and so I From the time I was in high school, I guess, having seen, uh, witnessed their progression and their careers, I thought that I would just combine the best of both and double major in accounting and computer science. They both interested me. Uh, I felt both of them would be solid career choices and would uh, set a foundation that I could use to go pretty much any different direction I wanted to. So that's that's sort of how I settled on that. And then when I got into assembly language, on the computer side of things, I reconsidered. <laughs> I did enjoy computer programming, and I, I, I did write some programs. And, you know, it was fascinating to me what you could create just with, you know, using code. But I felt like I needed to focus in one particular area, and that was kind of the point I got to where it was like, okay, I think I'm more interested in the business side of things. I love the idea of keeping up with technology and knowing enough to understand how things work behind the scenes, but I really think I'm going to be better served long term in focusing on a business career. So I continued to take some tech classes, but I I primarily just narrowed it. Just I'm going to get an accounting degree. So 
Interesting. You know, we're, we're both dating ourselves a little bit by the fact that you use the term assembly language, and I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> right? My daughter would not know what that means. Wow. Yeah, it's it's interesting how things change now because I, I would say to, to get some, some background in information systems is probably a great thing, you know, these days. And it was much different, much different back then. <laughs> well, and nowadays, you know, you can easily get that information by taking online courses. So you don't have to get go to college to get a degree. And I mean, you need, need to if that's really going to be the focus of your career, I guess. But if you want to have enough knowledge to understand how things work, you can do that in your in your free time online. Good point. Good point. So what was your first professional position like? Did you have an internship while you were still in school or you know what what was that process like for you? Well, I did work while I was in school and it was in the accounts payable department of a high tech research and development company. So I guess I still was kind of combining my two interests. I worked about 35 hours a week, I guess, and took about 15 hours per year in school per semester. And so I got some practical experience uh, just understanding how accounting worked in an accounting department uh, in a a tech firm. So I feel like that uh, reinforced my interest in the field and the idea that I had chosen the right path. I did that while I was in school, and then when I graduated, we had I was at UT Austin, so I got a bachelor's in accounting there, and back then it was the big eight CPA firms, and they recruited very heavily at UT Austin because it's one of the top accounting schools in the country, and so I had three different offers, and this was for full-time position. I did not, because I had the other job, I did not apply for an internship. So I chose Arthur Anderson, which people nowadays probably don't even know who that is, but (laughs) I uh, went to work for Arthur Anderson in Dallas, and I started on the audit side, and I was assigned to, you know, huge jobs, you know, banks or hospitals or uh, big engagements where I would pretty much sit and audit bank wrecks or long-term debt schedules all day long or work on inventory. You know, it was very limited perspective and very numbers oriented. And I quickly realized that that was not going to be satisfying to me long term. I, I, it was good experience. I enjoyed learning what I learned there, but I just, I just knew that auditing was not going to be for me. The other side of that was I felt like I was always interrupting people, always disrupting their day. And I didn't like that either. I I just, and it's interesting because years later when I was on the other side and I had the auditors come in, it was the same thing. It was like, oh, here they come again, you know? And it was like, I know why I'm not an auditor now because I did not want to be this person. Wow. Yeah, I'm curious because there's a big push and and there has been for, you know, decades now for individuals to go into public accounting, you know, right out of school and, um, you know, there's some perceived benefits. From the personal standpoint, do, do you feel like, you know, that was getting your career started off in the right way? Do you, do you feel like, yes, you know, that was a, a good move? Or, or do you think it it you know, would have been the same whether you went to industry or public? Or I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, I definitely think it was a good move. And I would certainly do it the same way again. I might not go to Arthur Anderson, but I, actually, <laughs> that was a great firm. I had wonderful two-week training program with people from all over the world. And, it, you know, it was a great foundation. I encourage, when I speak to high school students, I always encourage them, go get your accounting degree, plan to sit for your CPA exam, get your two years of experience at a CPA firm. And from there, you know, once you have that on your resume and once you've had the opportunity to work in maybe two or three different industries, you're going to have a much better feel for where you might like to land. And some people will find that they really enjoy public accounting and they like the opportunity to work with different clients and different industries on different types of engagements. And maybe they didn't really understand what that was going to be like when they were in college and now they love it, so they stay for me, it wasn't something that I wanted to do, but it gave me enough understanding of, I guess, the business world that it was easier for me to decide where to go next. 
So I definitely feel like, I mean, it's a great resume builder. I mean, at the time, Arthur Anderson was, you know, a premier firm. And anybody looking at that resume would be like, oh, this is somebody that we would love to have on staff. So I think it was nothing but positive for me. And I would certainly do it the same way again. Okay. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. So what was your next move from Anderson or or how did that come about? Yeah, so during the holidays, uh, my second year there, I was home back in the day. Do you remember when we had newspapers with classified sections and we actually (laughs) had to like comb through all the small print and print out actual hard copy letters, cover letters and resumes and mail them with a stamp. Um, I did all that over the holidays just to see, you know, what, what else was out there. I wasn't certain I was ready to leave, but I thought if I find the right opportunity, then I would be open to it. So I ended up getting an offer with a fairly new upscale maternity boutique chain called A Pea in the Pod. I think there are now Destination Motherhood, I think, is what they they were bought by a public company. And so they're still around, but in a different form. So I was offered a job there as a staff accountant. And I was there for about six months when the controller was let go. And so I was promoted. I had basic, basically been doing a lot of the work she was doing. So I was promoted to assistant controller. When she left, I was, you know, 21 years old and overseeing an accounting team and reporting to the CFO. And, you know, I was, I don't know, it was a great experience. I felt like I was in a little over my head, I guess, but I quickly (laughs) adapted and learned the ropes and learned so much there. They brought in, uh, they had brought in a CFO because they were planning to go public and he was he has a wealth of knowledge. Like I, I really just, you know, I appreciated the faith he had in me and I learned so much. They were building stores at lightning speed around the country and they really needed someone to take them public that had more experience than I did. So I realized that I just, it, I wasn't going to be that person. It, it wasn't going to be the best fit. So about that time, I heard about an opportunity with a national physician recruiting firm that was looking to relocate their headquarters from Southern California to Dallas. And they were looking to hire someone that was already in the Dallas area and then just bring them out for a couple of months of training and then have them come back and and help open the, the new corporate headquarters. So I joined this company. Their initials were MHA. Uh, they're also still around. We're also acquired by a public company wow. and also rapidly expanded. They were on the Inc. 500 list. They were opening new companies and divisions and locations every year. We had a temporary staffing firm, a lifestyle magazine publishing company, an equipment leasing company, a broker dealer. So, I, again, a tremendous wow. wealth and breadth of experience. I was making great money. I had stock options. I was on the executive committee, but I was working crazy, crazy hours, you know, 70, 80 hours a week. I was young and single and didn't have a family, so it it wasn't that problematic, but at some point, I just kind of got burnt out. So back to the holidays, I was in in (laughs) the Louisville area visiting my brother over the Christmas holidays and just happened to reconnect with a childhood sweetheart. I just decided to quit my job and up and move to the Louisville, Kentucky area and marry him. So oh, okay. that's what I did. I was just going to live the fairy tale, you know. I wasn't going to work. I was just going to, you know, have this life of ease and start a family. And <laughs> <laughs> it kind of worked out that way, I guess. My mom had worked when she was a bookkeeper. She had uh, worked at a church and the company, the firm that audited the church, she had established a, a good relationship with the partner in that, on that engagement. And so she connected me with him, basically just to learn more about, you know, the community and who I should be connecting with and what the business opportunities might be. Like I said, I wasn't ready to go back to work yet or didn't think I was. But I did meet with him and was intrigued. He was in a public accounting firm, much smaller than Arthur Anderson. We had about 50 people, I guess. And they offered me an opportunity to work pretty much whenever I wanted. I mean, it was, it, oh, wow. You know, CPAs were, CPA firms were more on the cutting edge, I guess, of the flex 
time than a lot of companies back then. This was, let's see, back in 1997, I guess. Mm. And so I said, I want to travel. My husband was in landscaping and he was from South Africa. So, you know, when it's summer here, it's winter there. And when it's, you know, winter here, it's summer there. So he didn't work very much during the winter. So he was like, I want to go, you know, spend a couple months in my home country. So interestingly enough, working for a CPA firm and taking off the winter is kind of odd because that's when most people are really working hard is in that January, February, March time frame. But they agreed. I mean, I, you know, again, I wasn't, I wasn't really a tax person. I wasn't really wanting to be an auditor again. So they weren't sure what I was going to do exactly, but they felt like there would be a, a place for me in some regard and we would just see what that was after tax season so I came in on I think my first day was well my first official day was in November and I basically came in and met everybody and then said okay I'll see you guys in March and went to South Africa and when I came back in March of course the the big push was on to meet the the deadline for April 15th so I got stuck doing 1040s even though I'm sure my realization was horrible because I didn't know anything except what I'd learned in school, which is not how to use tax software, right? It doesn't matter if you know the tax law. If you don't know which field to put it in, it's not going to produce the right answer. But I did that for 30 days. And then when April 15th came, we had a large engagement, audit engagement that started on April 20th. And I knew I didn't really want to do it, but they needed help. It was a first year audit. And so I went out in the field and did that. And when that wrapped up, there was a, a smaller startup business, that w- a millwork company that was looking to expand and get some financing. So I helped put together a business plan for that company. And I enjoyed that, that, you know, doing that small business consulting was something that interested me. And so I thought, well, maybe that's where I can focus. About that time, though, the firm announced that they were wanting to consolidate their three local offices into one, and they wanted some space on the southern Indiana side of the Ohio River, and there there just wasn't that much Class A office space that would accommodate us. So they bought land from the city right between the two bridges on the river and decided to build a six-level office building, commercial office building. So I said, hey, can I help with that? And so it, they said, sure, and I became the project lead on that. So I got to work with you know, all the contractors and the architects and the interior designers, and we had to do soil studies because there was a gas station there before. And it was, you know, it was a very um, intense time because I was also pregnant. So I was growing a building and growing a baby at the same time. But it was uh, another fascinating experience for me. You know, learned a lot of things the hard way. I don't recommend that CPAs go into the development business, but we did and we survived and we created a beautiful office space and then I was in charge of renting the space out because we took the top two floors, but we had four other levels that we needed to to lease out. So I helped with that and once we got fully leased, we needed someone to kind of be the firm administrator, the this company had not had a firm administrator. They had three offices, and each office kind of had their office manager. But once we brought everybody together, you've got 50 people in one building, and we needed someone to supervise the, admi- the administrative staff and to be more of an overall coordinator. So they created that position, and I raised my hand again and said, no, I'd like to do that. So I kind of created that role. And then we began to realize that, you know, we didn't have a director of HR. We didn't have a marketing or business development director. So we kind of brought that in under the firm administrator umbrella. And as I got more into those areas, I realized that's what I really like. I like meeting new people, connecting people, being out. I would go to campus and do campus interviews. I would go to marketing events and trade shows. And I just, I enjoyed that. So that's kind of where I landed. I, I said, you know, I, I'm working too many hours again. I didn't intend to get this this back into <laughs> the rat race. So let let me take a couple steps back. I've got a three-year-old now. I want to spend some more time with her. 
So how about you get someone else to do the firm administration stuff and I'll just focus on the HR and marketing and business development sides of it. So they were agreeable again, you know, they pretty much just let me create my own pathway and that's what I love. That's what I tell people when I coach them or when I mentor or or talk to groups of young people, I say, you know, it really can be more up to you than you might think. I, I understand that's a general statement and it's probably not going to apply everywhere, but in my life and what I've observed with other people, if you take the initiative and you talk to people about where your strengths and interests are, a lot of times they'll work with you to get you there. And so don't leave it up to someone else, you know, to shape your career. Make sure that you're observant and you're experiencing different things and you're asking to be on engagements or maybe to be involved in recruiting or to be able to attend a fundraiser with, you know, a partner. Like get involved in the shaping of your own future and with the idea that maybe someday you'll have your own practice. No, and even if you don't, you've still, if you think like an entrepreneur, you're going to be able to better serve your entrepreneur clients. So I've had a lot of success with trying different things and seeing where they went and asking for opportunities and very, very much paid off in my life. So I encourage anyone who's looking at a career in accounting to think about where you might take it because it really is a lot up to you, I think. You know, I, I, thank you for saying that. I, I was curious as you were telling the story. I, I'm wondering, I mean, is there something about your background or the way you work that just made you the natural go-to person? Because they, they did let you sort of pick the roles you wanted, or, or did you just constantly raise your hand when, you know, <laughs> when it became known that there was a need, I'll do it? I mean, how, how did all this happen? Why you? I say yes way too much. To, that's, that's just... <laughs> you know, part of part of the problem is, is I get bored easily. Well, I used to get bored easily. I'm always involved in so much now that I rarely get bored. But I think I just have so many general interests. There's so many different aspects of me that I don't want to narrow myself into one particular area of focus or path. So I think I'm always looking for those opportunities, and that's probably not your typical accounting personality. So I think some of that uh, came from the fact that I do feel like I probably use the right and left sides of my brain pretty equally, and you know that's not necessarily going to apply to everyone, particularly in this field. I also credit my dad a lot. So my dad, his funeral was October 25th. He just passed away at 89, and I was fortunate enough to be recognized by one of our local leadership organizations um, a few months ago, and they gave me the opportunity to to talk about the person on whose shoulders I stood. They were doing a little series about, about the people whose shoulders we stand on, and I was able to share, of course, at the time I had no idea because my dad wasn't sick. He was in good health. I had no idea what was going to happen, but I I got the opportunity to to highlight the fact that throughout my life, he was always the person that I watched figure everything. He was like the MacGyver. He would like figure anything out. There was nothing he couldn't do or nothing, no dare he wouldn't take. And he was just very much a go-getter. He was someone who would figure it out. You know, he just, he just had that can-do attitude and spirit and that determination to do whatever had to be done and to get the result he wanted. And so I watched him as I grew up. And he taught me the same thing. He basically would tell me, there's nothing you can't do if you set your mind to it. And he would show me, you know, how to do things like change the fan belt on a car and, you know, install a ceiling fan. And I'm not that mechanically inclined, but if I set my mind to something, I I thought I can do it. So that's kind of the mindset I approach things with. And I know I've told people in the past, you know, we I had uh, one coworker I worked with that was always, you know, giving you reasons why something couldn't be done. And I would get so frustrated and I would say, you know, tell me it's going to take a million years or a million people or a million dollars, but don't tell me it can't be done because I don't want to hear that. Like there is a way to make things happen. You may choose, you may decide it's not worth what it's going to take to to make it happen, but it can happen if you want it bad enough. And so I think I credit a lot of my, I guess, 
the variety of my success with that attitude that there weren't really limits in place. Mm. I, I could choose to learn or to figure out whatever I needed to. Mm. Yeah, so often it comes back to the life our parents set us up for, and that's, yeah, that is a beautiful thing. Well, all these transitions that you were talking about actually happened at a different firm, not where you are now. So, right. so let's, let's finish <laughs> <Yeah>. up. <laughs> Story's not let's, over. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's circle back and let, let's finish out the story because we, we need to get you to Demi Malone, let's say, in Ostroff, DMLO. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, so I spent 15 years at, at this um, accounting firm that I was at over in southern Indiana in, in all the variety of roles. And they entered into talks with one of the larger regional firms that was about uh, five times our size, I would say, at the time. And we ended up being acquired by that firm. And they had a marketing department. They had, you know, five full-time people. And while I was invited to join that team, I just didn't see myself, you know, I'd operated solo for so long and been able to pretty much carve out my own day and my own path. And I just didn't really see myself fitting into that. And the culture was very different in terms of the prior firm. It was very family oriented, very flexible, very open door policy and I didn't get that feel from the new firm. So about that time, two people reached out to me via LinkedIn that had saw the announcement of the merger and asked if I wanted to meet up for coffee. And so I did and uh, interview, ended up interviewing with two, both of those firms, two other firms in our area. And the one, DMLO, just it piqued my interest right away. And it goes back to the, the value of connections and the value of using social platforms to, to develop and nurture relationships. So I had run into this partner when my prior firm sponsored a golf tournament at a country club. And we were a whole sponsor, so we were sitting out there with our cooler full of beer. And he kept coming by, you know, making excuses to come over and, and get some beer from that girl. <laughs> so I guess he, I was joking around with him, and he remembered that. And so I, when he saw the announcement, like I hadn't had any other interaction with him other than possibly at a chamber event, you know, just crossing paths and saying hello. But he remembered me from that, and he reached out to me on LinkedIn and that's what led to the opportunity. They weren't looking for a marketing director. In fact, they'd had uh, not so great experience with one um, or a couple, I guess, in years past and had just decided they were going to have a marketing committee made up of four of their more involved partners in terms of business development. And they didn't need a marketing director. They had someone on the administrative side that did you know, all the normal marketing, promotional materials, trade shows, things like that. But in terms of having a higher level marketing position, they just didn't feel like that was something they needed. So they kind of revisited that and made space for me. And I've been here six years. And wow. it's, just, it's a great opportunity because, again, while I have my CPA, I still have that certificate on my wall. I maintain my continuing education. I do some client work. So I get it. Like, I, I understand their world. You know, I, I can talk the talk. I can have preliminary conversations with clients enough to understand who best to connect them with and whether or not we can even really help them. And so it, it's a good fit. Because when marketers come into CPA firms, if they've had traditional marketing training, a lot of times there's a real disconnect between how a CPA thinks and how a marketing person thinks. And so the typical time frame for a marketer in a CPA firm is two years or less. So I felt like I kind of had to edge up on that. You know, I've been in your world and, and I understand it and I can do that if I need to, but I can also help you with something that maybe is a little outside your comfort zone. So, you know, it works with some, it doesn't with others, but I try to focus just on those people who are interested in stretching and learning and building their book of business. And with those people, I try to figure out what's the best way to do that. Is it writing a blog? Is it going to events? Is it doing direct messages through LinkedIn? You know, what, what's 
the best fit for their personality and their interest. Maybe it's joining a board of an organization. Maybe they, they share an interest in, you know, we've got a new waterfront botanical garden. Maybe they're interested in that. And so let's, you know, join the board. And then you connect, can connect with other people in the business community that share that common interest. So a lot of what I do now is just is relationship-oriented, trying to figure out who to connect with who and, and how to best foster that relationship. Yeah, I just have to ask, when you were leaving your last firm, you know, during the merger time period and, and starting to have these conversations, was it the holidays again? Because that's <laughs> when you... When... You know, my last day was December 28th. Yes, ah, it was I the holidays it. again. <laughs> you know, I've not thought about that before now, but, but yes, you are correct. <laughs> I, yeah, I had noticed a pattern. I, I was just curious if it had continued. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the talks began, uh, I guess, early October. So it wasn't prompted necessarily by the holidays, but it, okay. did, end up, it did end up overlapping. That's too funny. Too funny. So tell us about DMLO because you, you've been there now for almost seven years, right? Is that pretty yes, close? I have. Okay. So tell us about the firm. What do you enjoy about it, or, or what what shells niche? You know, what, what's special about DMLO? Well, again, I think culture is one of the things that okay. is a differentiator for us. We have won awards for our workplace culture. There's uh, one award that used to be called, I think, the Alfred Alfred P. Sloan Award for Excellence in Workplace flexibility or something like that. I forget. It had a long name and they changed it, thankfully, to when work works. So just (laughs) when work works. And that is something that we've won multiple years in a row. And it's a survey of employees. It takes about 20 minutes and it's an anonymous survey. And they survey our entire staff and those who choose to respond. We have to, I think we have to get at least 40% response rate, something like that. And then they just analyze the results of all those responses and assign us a score. And the finalists, the the companies that are recognized, are in the top 20% of employers nationwide based on their workplace practices. And so I'm pretty proud of that. I feel like that, you know, when you have the employees that are reporting that and that it's real, you know, it's it's a genuine reflection on your culture. And for me, I always talk about control of time. And if you have control of your time, to me, that's priceless. Because there's so many demands on our time right now. And I can work 40 hours or 50 hours or whatever is needed, but I can't do it within the time frame of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day, right? That just doesn't fit most people's lives now. You've got kids and you want to be part of their events, their school functions, their sports. You've got parents that you're trying to take care of and take to doctor's appointments. And it's very difficult, I think, to work what used to be considered a normal work week. And so having control of your time and flexibility to work when it's the best time for you is just a wonderful benefit. I think you can't put a price to it. And it goes both ways. I tell people, you know, the firm, DML is very flexible with me and allowing me to do things during the day that I need to. But then it goes the other way, too. When they need me to attend a function that goes till 10 o'clock at night or maybe we've got a big proposal we're trying to get out and I need to work on the weekend, it goes the other way, too. So as long as there's balance, and you, we call it not work-life balance so much now, but work-life integration, I think that is a more accurate way to describe it because you're truly integrating every aspect of your professional and personal lives into a picture that makes sense for you, like a unique picture for your current phase of life. And I think that's one of the key differentiators for us. We have people that leave because the grass is greener, right? And then they come back. We just had a senior manager who had left and come back. So I think people maybe necessarily don't appreciate that until they've realized what it's like not to have that. Yeah, I like the work-life integration verbiage because I think the term work-life balance has been around so long now it's, it's just become a cliche and it means so many different things and it's really, it's really not descriptive. I like the way you summarize it. You know, control of your time is priceless. <laughs> yes, that, that says it all. <laughs> 
<laughs> it truly is for me. I, I really would have had to find a different opportunity if, if that wasn't available to me here. I've been the primary caregiver for my parents for the last 11 years and had a child in school, and it just it wouldn't have been possible for me to, to do the normal work week. But the other thing, that a couple other things, I like that we're a local independent firm. We work with a lot of local independent businesses, and the buy local movement is something that's pretty big in Louisville, Kentucky. And I, I think it's important. To, now, I, I'm not going to say I don't order on Amazon because I do because it's so easy, but I'm a big believer in supporting local independent businesses, and that's our primary client base. So I like that we're also a local independent firm and we're third generation. So we actually have some experience in, in being able to transition and to advise other companies about that process. And then the final thing, and, and arguably the most important, although I say control of time is pretty important, but our company, our firm is really focused on our impact in the community and in, on giving back. And we use the hashtag DMLO cares. And then our tagline is more than the numbers. And what that represents to us is not only do we see the big picture when we're working with clients from a business perspective, but we also are focused on adding value in terms of social impact and affecting people's lives in our community. And I've gotten involved in another organization uh, called Canopy that is focused on making Kentucky the premier place in the country for social entrepreneurs and people who want to work for them. So we might talk about that a little bit later, but that's another reason why I'm here is because I want my life to have meaning and Yes, helping people save money on their taxes so maybe they can do more in terms of charitable charitable giving or maybe uh, create a foundation to, you know, offer grants. I mean, there are a lot of good things that can come out of helping people with their finances, but it's not that direct, visible impact necessarily. You don't You don't actually get to see it change someone's life so much. And so being involved in the community and working with organizations that are doing that directly is fulfilling for me. And we had, we've had we won awards for that also. Uh, they have a program, our local business journal has a program called Partners in Philanthropy, and it's an awards program. Every year they have three categories, small, medium, and large businesses, and they recognize the top ten in each of those three categories in terms of their corporate philanthropy. And we, again, were recognized for four years in a row for not only our our cash contributions, but for also our volunteer hours. And in fact, we came in number one in our category for volunteer hours because with our firm of 90 people, we had over 6,300 volunteer hours in one year. So wow. if that gives you any indication of our commitment to supporting our employees, going out and doing fundraisers, being part of teams, serving on nonprofit boards, serving as volunteers. Pretty much any time someone wants to get involved in something, they're given encouragement to do so and support. I mean, obviously our clients have to be taken care of, and we have a large nonprofit practice, so a lot of taking care of them involves supporting the nonprofits. Uh, We also are very focused and have been. I think that's part of how the firm was originally founded back in 1975 is we want to make a difference in our community. And uh, CPA, in general, CPAs are nice people. They do good things, right? There's a lot of intuitive good that gets done. But I think to have such a focus and concentration in that is a differentiator for our firm. And I think actually you are hitting on something I wanted to make sure we covered before we we got done. Because you you mentioned B corporations or B corps. I think those are the social enterprises that that you were referring to before we – okay. Well, so a B corp is an actual certification that was developed by a company called B Labs, and they award it to benefit corporations that go through this 200-point assessment, they pay an annual fee, they have to score, I think, 80 or above on this assessment, and they are given the certification B Corp, and it's a a badge they can put on all their marketing materials and their website, and it basically says, you know, we've independently been authenticated or verified as a social enterprise who meets the criteria to be a public benefit corporation. But the actual 
designation Public Benefit Corporation or PBC is a legal entity structure. So you would register, for example, with the Secretary of State of Kentucky as a PBC, a Public Benefit Corporation, instead of a corporation or a partnership or a sole proprietorship or a limited liability company. You would register as a PBC. So there is a little misunderstanding usually from between what those two things are. And then you can have just regular social enterprises that aren't that legal status of a PBC and haven't gone through the B Corp certification process, but they have a structured social impact program. And they're focused on sustainability and employee workplace practices. And so the triple bottom line focus of people, planet, and profit is what defines a social enterprise. And, you know, this is a global movement. People are now beginning to hold organizations accountable for the choices they make in these areas. And younger people are wanting to work for organizations that share their values. So Canopy was created by the founder of or the president of the first B Corp in Kentucky and the first public benefit corporation in Kentucky. It's actually a janitorial service and they're the only janitorial service in the world to be a B Corp. And he saw how, I think the theme that he says is, is doing well by doing good. He saw how doing good things impacted profit and success. And so he said, you know, we need more people understanding what this business model looks like. And we need to help other enterprises move from doing intuitively good things to having a very structured, accountable program where they provide an impact report. And so that's Canopy was a nonprofit member organization that's been created, and they're developing a Canopy certification because a lot of companies in the Midwest maybe aren't even aware of what a B Corp is or wouldn't devote the time and money and resources towards going through that 200-point assessment. So the Canopy certification is going to have 30 assessment points, and it's going to be much more attainable. But the idea is, is to create more awareness of this business model and more understanding, and then eventually to create tax perks for social enterprises and to create job boards where if you're in Los Angeles and you want to work for a, you want to move and have a better quality of life, possibly, depending on how you define that, and you want to work for a social enterprise, then you can go to this Canopy website and search on the jobs that are available. Perhaps you're interested in food justice or homelessness or opioid addiction, whatever your interest area might be, you can find a for-profit social enterprise that's hiring that is looking to solve those problems. So it's a pretty cool it's a vision. It's a startup. So we're working to raise the funds and get the program developed. But I'm one of the founding board members, and that's part of the way that I bring meaning to my career, my business life, is by being part of this organization and hoping that it will lead to us being known as the firm, the accounting firm for social enterprises in the Midwest. Well, thank you. We got a good story and an education. <laughs> say podcast, well, I'm not sure so if that's where you good. where you wanted to go with that. Please feel free to cut that part out if it's not what you were wanting. That was wonderful. No, seriously, I, I learned something new on every podcast, and definitely on this one. So, no, thank you, thank you. I, I do want to be respectful of your time, and, and we have three questions we end every podcast with. I I had something that occurred to me though, as, as you were telling your story. I'm curious. So, you know, it was fortuitous that you studied accounting, became an accountant, became a CPA, but, you know, then your career took this other path. Do you think that you could have thrived if you would have stayed an auditor or maybe a tax person, or or do you think that it was really fortuitous that (laughs) that these other opportunities came along? Well, I did two tax returns every year, my parents when they were alive and, and my own, and it's torture. I mean, I dread it. I put it. I filed my tax return this year on October 14th, and it's not even complicated, you know, not really. I, I just don't see myself 
do and I've already explained to you why why I didn't enjoy the audit side of sure. things. And you know, there's a need for those roles. I don't you know, if my all my coworkers listen to this podcast, they're probably going to be like, "Man, I didn't realize she felt that way about what we did." And it's it's not I'm happy that they do it and I'm happy that there are people who enjoy doing that because it's a much needed service and I'm even happier about the people who can take it beyond, you know, just a tax return prep or an audit engagement and actually help a business to accomplish their vision and their goals and that's part of what CPAs do as well. And I probably would have, if I'd stuck in the public accounting world, that's probably where I would have gone with it. I know back in 2002, there was this thing, a company called Intact, which is all about, you know, accounting in the cloud and a platform where, you know, you do all your AP and AR and and everything in the cloud. And that, I remember being part of a webinar back in 2002 and thinking, this is the wave of the future. We need to jump on board with this. And, you know, here we are and our firm is recently in the past, I would say three or four years really embraced this whole idea of an outsourced accounting department and clients are loving it because they don't, you know, when you think about all the hassle that goes on with the hiring and the HR, the managing the responsibilities of an accounting staff and the space needs and the equipment needs and the IT support and just all the things that go with having an internal accounting department, especially if finance or business numbers is not your strength as an entrepreneur, it's just much better solution. I think it's a much better solution to outsource that to a CPA firm. And so that's an area that I'm very involved in developing as a niche and promoting to our clients and and to prospects here at DMLO. And I think I could have had a great run as an outsourced CFO kind of overseeing an outsourced accounting department, I think I would have enjoyed that if given an opportunity. Okay. I just had to ask. I mean, I really do believe that getting an education in accounting, and it gives you a good general business sense. And then when you become a CPA, you get the benefit of the doubt in almost anything business-related. So I, I think it does really open doors. And I just had to ask, though. So I- <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely agree. I, I I told my daughter, she's in the pre-med track, and I said, you know, you need to learn, whenever you have opportunities to learn from entrepreneurs, you need to grab a hold of those because everyone needs to understand the basics of entrepreneurship and the basics of business and finance. Because if you were to run a successful medical practice and hire people to do all those things, you still need to have enough understanding to know if you're hiring the right person and if they're doing the right job. You know, I mean, it's, so many people get in trouble with less than goodwilled people because they don't have enough of a basic understanding to realize when someone's taking advantage of them. And we see that often. I say often, hopefully not that often, but it more than we should, definitely. And it's because people don't have enough understanding just to be able to make wise decisions about that stuff. Sure. I mean, this is a little ridiculous, but it actually, uh, I mean, I think if, if a doctor was also a CPA, we'd probably trust them, you know, just that <laughs> as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I do end every podcast with the same three questions, so we we better get to those. The first one's usually the easiest. From a career perspective, what's been your proudest moment? There are several, but for the sake of time, I will focus on the most recent one, which was, I'd mentioned previously, the leadership organization here. It's called Leadership Louisville. They offer several leadership development programs, and they're very active in the community and very very well respected, and their annual luncheon is one of the most well-attended business events in our area, and they recognized me as one of the brand ambassadors for my work with promoting the organization and promoting other things that were happening in our community and being a connector of people. And that was really cool to be recognized for that because those are the things that I'm passionate about. It's not something I would ever think of 
getting an award for because it's just what I do. But it was really cool to get that sort of visibility. You know, I, I'm not so sure about looking up on this, I don't know, 20 foot screen and seeing my face. That was really <laughs> odd. But it was just an honor to get that recognition. And I was pretty proud of being recognized for something that I think is such a valuable part of any professional career. Mm, that is neat. Well, second question. Tell us about a lesson that you learned the hard way. Yeah, and the more details you can tell us, the better, because that, that's how we learn. So when I am passionate about something, it can be a challenge for me to keep my enthusiasm in check <laughs> when those around me don't share my passion or perspective. So I have to say that I have probably stretched some boundaries when I felt I had a good reason to. Many times it's paid off, but there have been a few times when I've really rubbed someone the wrong way with that. And I can think of a specific time that I caused some real damage to a professional relationship with someone that I admire greatly by just not using wisdom and discernment in my communications. I, I think I was stuck on a certain way of doing something and I was very vocal about it and I think I just pushed a little too hard to see things play out my way and not being respectful of the fact that there was more than one way to look at the situation and although my intentions were great I I think I should have recognized that it was time to back off and that you know I'd offered my opinion and my advice and my suggestions and while they might be good ideas they're was more to the story than I probably knew, and I just needed to uh, be a little less insistent. So I, I do, I find it hard to hold back when I feel <laughs> like I've got a really good idea or when something is really important, and, and I think wisdom would be the better part of valor there. So I have had to learn that myself. With me, it happens with associations. Like if I'm an association board something, I can get, or something like that, I can get very passionate about you know, a particular purpose or something we're trying to accomplish and 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 you just don't realize all the other things that are going on sometimes within the association. So yeah, I've been there. I can I can relate. <laughs> uh you know, enthusiasm and passion can be great things, but sometimes they have their drawbacks. So That's true. Well last question and then we'll go ahead and close it down. What has been the best piece of advice that you have ever received? I think what sticks out the most in my mind is that someone once told me everyone puts their pants on the same way and no one's concerned about yours being unzipped because they're too busy making sure their own are zipped. That visual, I guess, stuck in my head. But I tend to, you know, we tend to get so caught up in our own little world and, you know, if we've got toilet paper stuck on our shoe, you know, oh, my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. I walked around with toilet paper stuck on my shoe or my pants unzipped all day at school. And I'm sure everybody's just thinking what it, you know, what an idiot I am. Nobody's thinking about that, right? They're just glad they didn't do anything stupid today. <laughs> so I, I think that it took me a while to realize that, that, that the world, people were not thinking about me nearly as, I, as much as I thought they were thinking about me. Well, that is great advice. You've given me way too many visualizations in that particular piece of advice. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Those are the things that stick with me better, right? Oh, gosh, yes, yes. Beautiful. Well, that that really is wonderful to end this on. Thank you so much. I I really appreciate you spending your time with, with me and with the audience. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been an honor, Mark. Well, that was our interview with Delane Taylor. And some of the takeaways that I personally have from this interview were, were number one, how, how happy and, and just how joyful she sounds. She really has enjoyed her career. And then secondly, how all those, those unique opportunities came to her because she was always willing to help. And it's paid off in that it's given her a lot of variety in her career. And once again, you can tell she's really enjoyed it. I'm really glad Delene made time for this interview because I truly enjoyed recording it. If you found value in this episode for yourself, please check us out online. We're at www.whereaccountantsco.com. Like I mentioned earlier, we just launched a job board. And if you're an employer, along with checking out the new job board, another thing you may want to check out is our ebook called Hiring for Accounting. It's a comprehensive guide to help you specifically fill accounting jobs. 
You can find it all at www.whereaccountantsgo.com. Well, once again, thank you all for joining us. We will see everyone next week. There's more to come.